Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California section of the PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. Very excited and proud to welcome Mr. Bob Madsen, 2017 SCPGA section recipient of the Teacher of the Year Award on the uh, call this morning. Um, Bob Madsen is the Director of Instruction at the Sequan Golf Resort in El Cajon. Bob was also the uh, San Diego Chapters uh, Golf Professional of the Year in 2017 and some other accolades he has uh, um, in his uh, repertoire. He's been the, the San Diego Chapter Teacher of the Year as well as uh, the recipient of the Horton Smith Award for the San Diego Chapter as well. Uh, Bob currently serves on the section uh, teaching committee and has presented at numerous teaching seminars. His hope is that presenters will emphasize how they teach rather than what they teach. Good morning, Mr. Madsen. Thanks for being with us this morning. Morning, John. Good morning, everybody, and thank you. Fire when ready. Yes, sir. It is all yours. Okay, well, it's gracious of you. I'd just like to tell you guys a little bit about myself, and then we'll talk about what we're going to actually talk about. I grew up in Orange County. I played Southern California junior golf. My parents played golf. My grandparents played golf. Uh, I took lessons as a boy at Recreation Park from Frank Makepeace. Uh, those initial junior golf group lessons were 50 cents. Uh, 1969 or something like that. And then Rudy Duran became my first sort of real teacher at Hartwell Golf Park in Long Beach, part three course. It's where I really cut my teeth and kind of got, kind of got going as a competitive player at a young age. I graduated uh, private lessons with Mr. Tom Schopner at both Santa Ana Country Club and Friendly Hills. Those were my high school years and his tutelage was huge. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, your, your fingerprints are really all over my teaching today. I am and have been very fortunate for this incredible upbringing in the game. So I took at least 500 lessons from these men before I ever gave one. Being on the receiving end of so many lessons became the basis of my initial ability to teach at all. I worked at Huntington Seacliff in high school under David McKeating and summers during college at San Diego State. Went back up to Orange County and worked at Miles Square under Jim Caspio and Santa Ana Country Club a couple of summers under Mike Reel and Gerald Nodrop Hall. I've been at Singing Hills now since 1983, now called Saquon, of course. Proudly Native American owned and operated and been teaching full-time here since 1991. We have two championship courses, an 18-hole par three course, along with a 100-room hotel. Staff includes director of golf, Clint Higgins. Lead instructor is Kim Estep, LPGA. Julie Day, who runs our School of Golf for Women and many of our group lessons and special of events. Rick Lindemann, Class A PGA, and Scott Oles and Jason Schneider, who's the golf operations manager. I owe them all, and Saquon, a debt of gratitude. I simply could not do what I do here without the freedom of movement that Clint gives me and the in the trenches support from the guys that are answering the phones and taking the tea times and checking people in. Thank you guys so much. Um, also, just as far as background, a couple of major turning points for me. There, there have been many. Um, taking lessons from Tag Merritt at Fairbanks Ranch. Tag was the golf coach at San Diego State, I think, when I was a junior. And Tag specialized in something that I consider rather extraordinary. He specialized in what you were doing right. I honestly don't remember Tag ever telling me or any of the people that I ever saw him teach I don't remember him ever telling anybody what they were doing wrong. 
He used video. He's a pioneer with the use of the VHS camera along with Carl Welch. He used video to show how what I was doing or others, how what I was doing was the same as Tom Watson. Always reassuring without too much cheerleading. The lessons with Tag, and he's still my teacher, although he's moved up to Washington, were huge in showing me what a caring and wonderful golf lesson could be like. He had an incredible calm bedside manner. That's kind of the model today that I still try to live by. We became friends. He was patient with me, and I'm lucky to have found him. I'm a better player because of tag for sure, and more importantly, a better person for having spent tag with, time with tag merit. Second big turning point I'd like for you guys to, to know about was studying the book, The Inner Game of Golf. Uh, Tim Galloway came along with this book and cut some new ground. You know, basically all the golf instruction that was available up until that time was about the mechanics, the angles, the parts, the pieces and positions, and there wasn't a whole lot in regard to self-control or how to think your way around the course, the inner game of golf, the mental game. I believe if you're giving lessons at all and if you have not studied the book, The Inner Game of Golf, you should get it and start. Uh, largely, it talks at length about trying too hard. I believe 100% that we're all trying too hard and our students are all trying too hard. And that book, and having heard Mr. Galway speak in person a couple times, a huge re reason why my lessons are the way they are today. I believe that if all we ever did was help people learn how to relax and not try so hard, uh, we'd be doing the game a great service. About the first thing I have all my students check if they make a bad golf swing, we ask, hey, were you trying too hard? So we believe when you get trying too hard, it gets into the body and the arms and the shoulders. Tighten the arms and the club don't swing freely. So we believe that freedom in the swing and effortlessness are huge. Uh, they're cornerstones in my teaching. The inner game broke new ground when it first came out and is still relevant. I recommend it. So thank you for bearing with me during that introduction. Today's topics. We're going to talk a little bit about what kinds of behaviors I consider to be not negotiable. Absolute musts. We're going to talk about how you can teach them to play golf right from the start, right from lesson number one. This third one is a very big subject. We're gonna to touch on two of my biggies in terms of how you can set yourself apart from other teachers or ordinary golf instruction, as I might call it. And this number four, this has to do with helping students succeed repeatedly in practice. Um, I'm a big proponent of having the practice sessions filled with success. Probably the word that I use most during my golf instruction is, yep, because this, I just witnessed a successful repetition. And then that last one, um, most of my clients do not need a quick fix lesson. They do not need fixing at all. They don't need repair. We're going to talk a little bit about a repair sort of lesson. Most of my clients instead need experience. So talking a little bit about absolute musts. I think rule number one for golf instruction needs to be the golden rule. Treat people the way that you want to be treated. Secondly, Consider for a moment that you're actually not really teaching golf. You're teaching human beings who are mostly after more fun. I think we get a little too full of ourselves and what all we know about golf and we forget that you've got a fellow human being in front of you. Most of the people that we teach are mostly there to have more fun. Bottom line, lower scores are important to not everyone, True recreational golfers might not even have a scorecard with them, but lower scores are important to many, that's for sure. I recommend, though, always keeping fun 
at maybe the very top of your list in terms of what you're after with your students. Interestingly to me, the more you're able to help them relax and have fun, the better they play, the lower their scores. It can be the other way around, right? If they play better, they have more fun, but it works both ways. So as far as not negotiable, I consider punctuality to maybe be number one or two, maybe two if the golden rule is number one, punctuality and dependability. I believe strongly that you need to be there, ready to go and on time for your lessons. If that lesson's supposed to start at nine o'clock, I recommend not showing up at 9.02 or 9.05. Of course, occasionally we do have lessons that run over and students understand that. One of my pet peeves is when I go to the doctor's office, right? Another example of a professional and you arrive five minutes early for your appointment and they call you in 15 minutes later. Of course, it's understandable. We roll with the punch, but punctuality is, is an indicator of your professionalism and the students will appreciate it. Another one is just being friendly. You know, kindness is king, I believe. Being friendly, generous with your time as, as much as you possibly can be and kind of gentle and considerate of your fellow human beings. Again, we get a little too busy with, you know, swing plane and weight distribution and right elbow close or whatever you're into. And we forget that just a little gentle touch and some kindness might be all that it takes. A person could improve just from being around being kind of the right bedside manner. Some clients though, like a tough coach, professional coaches have the capacity to move from gentle to tough as need be and then back to gentle. None of us like the high school football coach, I don't think who's screaming at the top of their lungs and tearing their hair out. I know for a fact that my son didn't play high school basketball because of the winner take all attitude and um, the coach was yelling the whole time, so he quit. Just be friendly and generous and gentle and considerate. I believe these are fundamentals that aren't talked about enough in terms of what we should be doing with our clients. Enthusiasm, probably we're all pretty good at that. I recommend, you know, arriving at the lesson T excited and eager and really interested in what you're doing. I have had lessons, not from any of the gentlemen that I mentioned earlier, where it was kind of cookie cutter and, and the person's looking at their watch and you can tell that they're kind of trying to get the lesson over with and it's, it's kind of a half hour conveyor belt thing. And, and I think that's shameful. I'm a big fan of enthusiasm. Empathy kind of goes along with the golden rule. You know, taking into consideration the other person's life. We have human beings in front of them. They have, they have feelings. And you're not just dealing with golf swings. Patience. I'm still working on this, getting better at it every day. We are faced with slow, sometimes painful progress and incompetence. Our students are not competent. It's our job to bring about competence in them and patience is a good natured tolerance for delay and incompetence. I feel like we need, we need to get better at this because to the degree that we lose patience, we try to speed up a process that can't be sped up. And most learners can sense it if we are starting to lose our patience. I would like for your students to compliment you on yours. In terms of personalization, again, kind of back to the golden rule, knowing and meeting the customer's needs you know, what is the customer after? What are their goals? You're not just having your method or your agenda or your series of six. You know, we profile students ahead of time to get our feet in their shoes because we are so good as a result at personalizing their experience. 
to some extent, it doesn't even have to be a lesson. I have students who come and they just want to get away from their work. They want to get away from their families, let's say. They just want to enjoy some time at the golf course. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lesson, quote unquote. It doesn't have to be instructional. You can spend an hour with someone just with them on the golf course. It can be just an ex extraordinary experience at your facility with you. So I'm going to add one to the list here. I recommend never, never, never overwhelm anybody. Again, I'll use myself as an example. I took golf lessons that contained too many things. And you get boggled. You know, people are already overwhelmed with their busy lives. You know, I'm a trained recreation professional, a degree in recreation. I'm into the, you know, the fresh air and the relaxation. People are out here overwhelmed with their busy lives, their families, their physical troubles. They've got financial issues. They're trying to put kids through college, mother-in-laws in a nursing home. And they're especially overwhelmed in terms of golf. There's so much information available. You almost can't help but become overwhelmed. Golf Channel, YouTube, subscriptions to golf instructors online, the commentators during the broadcasts on TV, magazine content, and they're all getting advice from their buddies, which I would really like to stop because most of that is a rules of golf violation at the same time. So world according to Madsen, we are in the relaxed, take it easy business. We need to give them less to think about, not more. We start a ton of beginners partly thanks to our par three course and all three of our courses being walkable and affordable. We start a bunch of novices. I've lost track in the last six months how many brand new golfers never touched a club before we've started up. So let's say we've got this novice golfer never touched a club before, never been to a golf course before, doesn't know Jack Nicklaus from a ball mark repair tool. And just as a side note, a little background, you know, with the help of Fred Shoemaker and, and Tim Galway in particular and others, many, many years ago now, we turned the thing on its head. I'm talking about the list, what I call the list. Like the first thing you would teach someone, working down this list to the last thing you would teach them. The first thing we would teach would always be hand placement or grip. I don't use the word grip, by the way. Um, I don't want my students gripping the club. I want them to hold the club. So we don't use the word grip, but it used to be grip, stance, ball position, and alignment, and teach them how to hit a golf ball. And then eventually, we would take them out on the course and teach them how to play golf. And then eventually, we would teach them how to have fun. So we turned this list upside down partly because they saw the average score in the United States wasn't coming down. It's been 91 since about 1952, I think, as we decided that something needed to change in terms of traditional golf instruction. So we were willing to take a look in a mirror and say, hey, let's maybe do some things a little differently. So we flipped the list and thought, you know what we should do is we should teach fun first and teach them how to play golf. So... I don't carry tee markers with me all the time, but if I know I have a lesson coming who's a novice, I bring an eight iron and a putter, hopefully knowing ahead of time whether they're right or left-handed, and two tee markers, like the heavy balls with the spike on the end, actual golf course tee markers. And depending on who it is, depending on the athlete, whatever, I will put these tee markers in the ground maybe 15 feet off the edge of a green. And I will tell them that this is the starting line, right? There's an imaginary line between these two markers. You see over there, there's a stick with a flag on it. And they go, yeah, so this is the flag stick. And they go, okay, cool, I got it. 
That thing's in a hole in the ground, and we're going to play from the starting line until the ball goes in the hole. Do you understand? And everyone says yes. Five-year-olds say yes. And if golf gets any much more complicated than that, I tell them something's wrong. Starting line, hole in the ground, golf your ball until the ball goes in the hole. If it starts to get any more complicated than that, uh, instructions goofing them up, and that's not okay. So I have them chip it with a seven or eight iron. I have them chase after it, chip it again. No instruction, don't care how they hold it, don't care how they stand. Just making sure they're safe and others around are safe until that ball gets on the green. And then I have them go putt until that ball goes in the hole. And almost always person pulls their ball out of the hole with a big giant smile on their face. And you can tell that they're immediately relieved and I say, congratulations, you're a golfer. You know, five minutes ago, they were scared to death and thought golf was hard. So after we do that for a few minutes, and it's all small and warm and fuzzy and wonderful, I, I drive them to the first tee of the par course so they can see what it looks like on a bigger scale. The first hole on our par three course can be 200 yards. So they see, holy crap, it gets a little bigger and then I might drive them over to the first tee of the Willow Glen or the Oak Glen championship course. And then I say, do you see that flag stick way down there? And they go, yeah, barely. Holy crap. And they sort of realize they better get with it in terms of practice. So anyhow, it's just giving them a golf lesson right from the start. I might even just let them putt with a flag in. I don't care if they step in someone's line. I don't care if almost don't care what they do as long as they're having fun. I would never probably give a novice or a beginner their first lesson on the driving range. And I would just flat never have it be full swing. Teach them how to play. Doesn't have to be necessarily well right from the start. Just teach them how to play. They get to walk, breathe, smile. It's like painless small golf. I call it the shallow end of the pool. You're over by the steps, one hand on the railing. We're going to blow some bubbles. My wife's a swim instructor, so she teaches me the parallels, right? So we sit on the steps, hang on to the railing, and blow a few bubbles. You don't throw somebody into the deep end, watch them start to drown, pull them out of the pool, oh, video it, and then tell them everything that they were doing wrong. But I kind of feel like that's what golf instruction does. We chuck them in the deep end, we video them while they're suffering, and then we tell them all the stuff they're doing wrong, and it's just not how I roll. If you don't have a golf hole to take them out on, you're going to have to use your imagination. I understand some of us are teaching at driving ranges or what have you, or don't have the freedom of movement that we have here at Suquan, so maybe some whistle balls and a coffee mug in the golf shop. You can teach them. You're going to start here and play to there or go to the chipping green at your facility and mock it up. Our clients are jazzed. They get to golf right from lesson number one. Even though it's tiny at the very first lesson, they leave having gotten some exercise. They didn't hurt themselves. They've had nothing but success and a good time on a very now, small- Now, Bob, with, uh, with uh, lesson number one, taking them right out onto the golf course, is that for every skill level, even when you have a, a single digit that comes to you or a collegiate player? Um, does your philosophy and your approach uh, change with the better skill level of the student? It's a good question. And you'd have to follow me around for 100 lessons to see, quote unquote, what I do. But this, this part of the presentation, John, thank you, is more geared for what do I do to help an absolute beginner get started? We're trying to expand player development. You get more players interested in the game and finding out how to make it fun for that student the very first lesson. The subject would change. You know, I coached the San Diego City Senior Amateur Champion, very first lesson. I didn't need to go on the golf course because of the background information he gave me a few years ago. I sort of knew something about his game and there was a particular aspect of his game we knew to start with. It happened to be weight shift. And so, no, that first lesson was done on the driving range, for example.
So just to kind of wrap that up, it depends on the need. Um, you know, one of my sayings is the golf is a better teacher than me. Carry on. Please. Okay, cool. So kind of in line with lesson number one and being on the course, I'm going to go to the next slide here. By the way, Chris Locke, our section one-on-one -on -one marketing guy, has prepared this PowerPoint for me. So he helps me with my website, my Instagram, and my Facebook, and is kind of a, a business coach and a little bit of a life coach to me. I want to thank Chris for that. I recommend contacting me to get his information or the section office, I believe, to get started with Chris in terms of help with your marketing. I believe that the first few hours are still complimentary. I believe his services are well worth it, and he's a super cool guy to work with. So I like to do things a little differently, partly because of what I mentioned before about the traditional golf instruction not really working. So grip, stance, ball, position, alignment, we find that we can help people learn to play golf in the traditional way, and they get better slowly yawn. Huh. I'm going to give you a couple of ways that you can set yourself apart. There are a number of ways. I've become relatively unafraid in terms of setting myself apart and doing things a little different. It is intentional, uh, but it is more because of the fast progress that we see in doing things a little differently. One of those things is you know, having the courage to be willing to take a chance and not be afraid. I think it's real easy to kind of stay with safe methods of golf instruction. Again, sort of ball position, alignment, weight distribution, uh, feet, knees, hips, and shoulders all lined up down the target line. You know, all good stuff for sure. But you know, I try to try to be a little more inventive. I guess might be the right word, and you know, trust my instincts to give me permission to give the students some other unusual tasks or drills or games or exercises. And, you know, just between this audience and my friend Rick here and myself, I kind of want to make it easier on me. If I can speed their process, make it easier on me and have everybody have a good time. Uh, I don't see that. I don't see there's any sort of a lose in that. It's a win win. But I'll leave it up to you as to when you would offer these things. I'm just throwing them out there as tools that you might be able to use with your clients. These are things that I use an awful lot. One of them is eyes closed practice swings. So you might ask the student, hey, do one practice swing, no ball, and then hit one ball, eyes open. You can probably imagine, probably a lot of you use eyes closed practice swings already as it is. Thank you for that. Please continue. I believe strongly in the fact that it improves balance. It places a demand on the athlete's agility and balance. Eyes closed, a little tougher to hang in there at the finish. We also believe that eyes closed promotes swinging through swinging through as if there was no ball in the way. Um, I don't like the word hit. I try to get my students to remove the word hit from their vocabulary. So we use let the ball get in the way, or I'm going to send a few range balls, just vocabulary wise. So eyes closed too, we believe it's a trust factor, right? You get to find your own rhythm and learn to trust. Trust your rhythm and trust your balance and trust that the ball is going to get in the way. By the way, at the end, I'm going to give you my contact information. And, and if you guys have any comments or questions during the presentation, uh, please feel free. Um, I would welcome that. Another tool that I use that's a little different, take some courage, is send the person out with just three clubs. They're like, what? Yeah, let's just go play with three clubs and give them a give them a five wood and a seven iron and a putter or a six iron and a wedge and a putter. You guys probably know what happens when you walk with a small carry bag and there's no indecision. 
and you have to create shots. I'm a big fan of shot making. Um, boy, I'm not sure which is king or queen, shot making or course management. A big, huge fan of shot making. You know, high ones, low ones, getting students to play different heights of shots and different shapes of shots. And if they go out with just three clubs, they got to. Interestingly, people shoot the lowest scores of their lives for, let's say, six holes or nine holes with a little bit of supervision, a little bit of coaching. Playing with fewer clubs removes indecision. It strips golf down to a simpler form. Golly, I don't know. Did the original, what were they, Rick? Shepherds? The shepherds in Scotland, and they were knocking stones around with a with their crook. So they literally only had one club stripped down to the original form. And one of the things that I mentioned to clients is surfers go out into the ocean with one board. They surf all the different waves with just that one tool. Rick is saying no. They have more than one board? Not when they're out there, but in their truck or in their garage, they have all kinds of different. Oh, so they're going to change boards depending on the conditions they see? See, that's helpful to me. I don't know anything about surfing, even though I grew up in Huntington Beach. So different boards for different circumstances, right? But once you're out there, I think sometimes people with 14 clubs, they get out there. My wife plays with four. And she knows exactly when to use each one. You know, she knows when to hit her driver. She knows when to hit her seven iron. She switches to her pitching wedge when she needs to and then putt. She just can't be bothered with 14 clubs. It's just too many. And I think we're probably guilty of selling people more clubs than they need, which that kind of gets us off the subject a little bit. Golf pros like selling clubs, and and I understand that. Another one is send them out to play by themselves. And they're like, what? And some people don't function real well. My best friend in the world, Theo, he hits about four range balls flying solo, and he's bored to death looking around for somebody to talk to. He would no, he would never play golf by himself. So you have to judge, you know, is the person going to be able to function and send them out there? Walking in the evening just by themselves, no one watching, no scorecard, less self-conscious. And they can find out kind of how refreshing golf can be, you know. Another one that we like, which is kind of a little bit contrary, is pressure-packed practice. For example, putting for money with someone who's better than you. So it might cost you some money in the short run, but all of our students gravitate toward present company. So I ask my average golfers that can't break 90, I try to get them paired up with people that shoot in the low 80s so they can see what it looks like, gravitate toward present company. Pairing students up with students that are better than them for drilling or practice or play, super valuable. Folks get stuck playing with their same old group, the same old time on the same old day, play the same old game, no wonder the average score in the United States is 91. Take away their driver. Person's having trouble with their driver and they're having trouble breaking 85, take it away. Again, my apologies. I get free stuff from Callaway. Thank you very much, Callaway. They don't want me telling you this because they want me to have you buy a new driver. And we do. I sold a couple drivers this last, this last month. Have them tee off with their five wood. Just again, it's having the courage to ask something a little different of your students, noticing that none of these things are, quote, instructional. They're activities. They're changes of pace. Just have them do something different. I call it changing up the recipe or changing up the program. People are stuck doing the same old thing in the same old way. And they might have them tee off with their five wood for a month. Depending on how often they play, it might only take a few rounds for them to see the light. And then they might be more able to hit their driver because now they've started to relax on the teeing ground in general. Some people may never go back to their driver. Require them to play from the forward tees, maybe for a month. See that they can shoot the scores that they want to shoot. 
from the teeth a little further forward and then they can work their way back. Powerful, powerful tool. Way too many people playing from too far back. I know the movement Play It Forward is helping us with encouraging people to play from forward tees. And, and I've been doing it for 25 years and I'm a big fan. Here's one that's a little more heavy duty. I assigned a thousand two and a half foot putts the other day to one of my scratch players who's got some pretty starry eyed goals. In fact, the Golf Channel National Senior Amateur Champion and we work in terms of thousands. When I give him a homework assignment, I don't ask for a few or a few hundred. We operate in terms of a thousand. So, hey, this week I need a thousand to two and a half foot putts. It's like people go, really? Yeah, you want to get better, right? So depending on the status, stated goals, I crank the homework up. Another one that I like real well, persons killing themselves with double bogeys. Okay, here's the hundred hole challenge, Bill. I need you to play a hundred holes consecutively without making a double. I don't care if you make any birdies. I don't care if you make any eagles. I don't care if you make any pars. Just stop making double bogeys and force them to make better decisions in order to eliminate the double bogeys and the blow up holes as a result of poor decision making. Puts just real emphasis on course management. So one more thing in terms of how to make yourself different, this one's a biggie. Um, stop flinching, right? So the student hits a bad shot. You feel this horrible twinge in your gut and your soul and it's heartbreaking and you feel this awful reaction like you got to do something right away because this person's suffering especially watch yourself with little kids because there's a chance they duffed it and they're smiling and they just want to do another one and leave them alone. You don't have to flinch and jump in there after every bad shot and feel bad and get all heartbroken and try to come to their rescue. We're not paramedics. So the learner's drilling along, right? Say he's hitting little half shots with an eight iron to the hundred yard pole and he's going along great no problem, you're coaching him, talking about what you're gonna make for dinner that night, leaving them alone, maybe working on their balance, something simple and clank, off goes the hosel rocket, straight to the right for this right-hander. Can you imagine? So my recommendation in that situation is learn not to move, like physically stand still. Don't move. Don't budge, don't walk around in circles. Show them that you're like a rock of Gibraltar. This practice session is not going to waver. We are going to stay on this drill. Don't blink, don't panic, and for sure, don't change the drill. I promise you, we are really bad at this. And it's just because we want to help. We want to help this person, but we flinch and we panic. We change the drill and try to fix it. And heaven forbid if they hit another bad shot and ask you, what did I do wrong on that one? And this is how lessons get sidetracked in my, in my book. Put the student back on the drill. Flinch. Do not get desperate. Do not become impatient. Do not try something else. This is how lessons become filled with too much information. Learning involves suffering. If you're going to learn to play guitar, you're going to have some suffering. If you're going to learn to swim, there's going to be some suffering. If you're going to learn rock climbing, be willing to suffer along with the learner. You selected the drill, and now you're the drill sergeant. Stay with them, keep them on the drill, and trust that the drill and the process will move them out of it. Side note on shanking. Um, not sure how many shankers we've dealt with, but most folks think it's a club face issue. The face of the club must be pointing out to the right for the right-hander. Uh, we know that's not what it is. The face is not the issue. It's a heel strike. Ball comes off that hosel. It's going sideways. So help them understand 
that it's not the face angle. Trying to close the face in order to fix the shank in my book breeds the shank. As you get better at not flinching, your lessons are more likely to be kept simple and contain maybe just one thing. Carrying on. Thank you all for your kind attention. When in trouble. Well, Bob, uh, can you talk a little bit about the image of the flex capacitor there on the screen? <laughs> well, thank you, John, for recognizing that this is the flex capacitor from the DeLorean. And I can't remember if there was trouble and they needed to go back to the future and I got confused watching the movie. So they ended up going back to the past, I thought. But I was all goofed up, but PGA Chris yeah, they went put back that to the there. past on accident, but then had to go back to the future, and then had to go back to the future again, and then back to the past. So, um, but that image is very recognizable in terms of being able to uh, uh, go back to the beginning, because um, you got to have that to do it in the movie. Got it. Got it. And thank you to my genius, who I call him PGA Chris, who built the slideshow. So that's awesome. So when in trouble, go back. If you're in the forest and you get lost and you're not sure where you're going, don't keep going forward. Turn around, look for the trail of breadcrumbs and go back. So I try to give my students a big trail of breadcrumbs as we're moving forward. They have a way to get back. You know, if you're up, if you're out skiing and you're on a big, narrow, icy hill and you can't possibly handle it, go to an easier hill, right? Go to a hill that's more your skill level. You wouldn't keep them going on that hill and give them a bunch of skiing instruction. You take them to an easier hill. I believe we need to do better at this. You know, I give a student a task or an objective they can handle. I want to watch them doing something they can do so we can all win and they can have success as they're moving forward. Now, let's say it's a putting lesson, just for example. We want to get better at holding those short putts, you know, starting with two footers over and over again, holding one after another. Here's an example of a task. We're going to do 10 sets of five. So I need five in a row, 10 times, kind of like going to the gym. We, we, we have it be like a routine at the gym or one aspect of your routine at the gym, right? So then when that's done, okay, we hold five sets of 10 sets of five. Sorry, I got 50 in a row from two feet. When that's done, we move back. Let's say we move back to three feet. So the task just got a little bigger and they start missing. And they start to get frustrated. And they start to ask you, what am I doing wrong? I won't answer that question most times. We just go back, just go back to the two footer. So when in trouble, when the practice session gets in trouble, I teach them to go back, right? If they're on the range hitting five woods, and it starts to go bad and they're not sure why, key, they're not sure why, they go back to the seven iron. They're not hitting the seven iron well or correctly, their satisfaction. We're gonna go back to the pitching wedge or go back to half swings. Just go keep going back until the practice session can be filled with success. They can still work on the thing that you gave them to work on. It's just they have to have a platform for success. You're not going to get better unless we're succeeding repeatedly. I think the definition of practice is something to let's say repeated success with an interest in acquiring skill, I think is the definition of practice, honestly. So practice sessions go bad. Instructors jump in. They try to fix the stroke or the swing. Students desperate. Instructors a little itchy. And I'm saying, no, don't give them swing corrections. Fix the practice session. Have them go back. Give them something they can do. So it can't be broken if it never worked. This has to do with repair and fix it lessons versus just providing avenues for the students to gain experience. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Let's say. You've been coaching your best friend in the whole world. You know him well. You know his game very well. He's a four index. 
with a really good short game that you've helped him build. One day he comes to you, his scores are goofed up, and he says, hey, pro, I've lost my chipping. You schedule a lesson, and sure enough, after watching a few, you notice he needs help. He needs a reminder. His ball position, let's say, is out of whack. For some reason, it has crept forward, and he's fatting them all. Well, you just tell him to move the ball back. He does that and starts flushing every chip, and all of a sudden, the angels are singing, and he declares you a miracle worker because you fixed it, right? Well, you had to have known his game in the first place. You had to have seen where it went out of repair. It had to have been in repair at one time. It had to have been competent and able. It went into disrepair. At that point, you can serve as a diagnostician as a, as, and as a mechanic. We do that too often when the person is merely inexperienced. We try to go in and fix it. You know, it can't be fixed if it was never, if, you know, it can't be broken if it never worked in the first place. So another scenario, and the below is kind of provided, it's kind of predicated on having a golf hole. If you don't have a course at your work, um, Side hill, uphill, downhill training aids do exist. Uh, I found one this morning, golf incline trainer, again, for practicing side hill, uphill, downhill in the driving range, <clears throat> excuse me. Also found one called the real field golf map. <clears throat> so this person does not need repair. Scenario number two. The student has never been able to play side hill, uphill, downhill shots. They're just not good at it. They're struggling to learn them. Do not try to fix them with a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Maybe mention a little bit about keeping your balance. I highly recommend coaching course management and asking them to make a smart play and just get out of trouble. Many amateurs are making goofed up swings on side hill, uphill, downhill. when they should be just making a chip shot back out into the fairway. They're taking too big a swing and losing their balance. So there can be a little bit of coaching or some uh, some advising on that. But too much isn't what's needed. So you don't want to give them like seven things to remember from the last golf magazine. Don't do it. They don't need fixing. They need. They don't really even need instruction so much. They need experience. Take them out on the golf course. Throw some balls down, give them a do-over. I'm kind of the king of the do-overs. The golf course is a better teacher than me. I put them in the context and let the context be the teacher. I recommend having extra balls in your pocket so the student can have a do-over. So we're going to recap here as we get close to 9 o'clock. I believe in a few absolute musts and professionalism in general. Uh, I trust those are points that you guys can agree with me on. You can teach them to play golf right from the start. A couple of ways on how to make yourself different. Don't flinch. Be courageous and adventurous in your coaching. When the student's in trouble, you can fix them. If they need experience, just give them the tools that they need to gain experience. And when they're in trouble, help them find their way back. Some of this stuff, I know I'm preaching to experienced golf instructors, so I apologize if I'm preaching to the choir. And I appreciate very much your attentiveness. Thank you again to everyone here at Saquon. Most of all of the professional staff here and I have been together for decades. I appreciate you guys more than you will ever know. Thank you to all who have listened. Thank you to Mr. Kulo for putting this on in the section for your support and allowing me to do this. And thank you to the section teaching committee, Chairman Chang, Billy McKinney who came before, all of you. I'm humbled and honored to be part of the work that you're doing. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them now. You can reach out to me at bmadsen at saquonresort.com. You can reach us at saquonresort.com. It's also Madsen Golf 
www.madsongolf.com, www.madsongolf.com, and Facebook and Instagram. Bob, we have a question here. Just bear with me here. I got an inbound call that's ringing on the same line. Let it run through. Um, a question in terms of uh, uh, that when you refer to not flinching, um, how does that play into the student's request or the student's sense of urgency when something like that happens, when they ask for immediate assistance? How do you go about calming them down and, 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 and letting that ride itself out? You talked about the how really you remain, but how do you keep the student calm during these little panic sessions? Really good question. And, and there'd be, you know, a thousand different situations that would require a thousand different handlings. And I think it's one of the problems with teaching teachers is we start to give rules on how situations should be handled. And my offer is just in general, we freak out and there's no need. Um, you know, obviously kind words like that's okay, let's do another one. Um, I might actually change the subject right after a little bit of a panic. You know, asking what they're having for dinner. Or how was that Jeff Dunham concert the other night? Uh, you gotta have tools at your disposal to help them without necessarily boggling them with too much instruction and neither one of you getting in a panic. Are you uh, currently working with any uh, tour players or mini tour players or collegiate players? Let's see, I kind of have known a little bit for my senior amateur. I've got Dan Sivage, the Golf Channel National Senior Amateur Champion, and Don Eklund is the San Diego City Senior Amateur Champion. I have had college players. Uh, Byron Mess won the uh, Pub Links in 2015, played in the Masters, and was on the Canadian Tour. Kevin McCall is an assistant professional at Steel Canyon, was the assistant player of the year in the section once upon a time, and considers himself a mini tour player. So. So yeah, and all of us here have a wide range of clients. We have top level amateurs. We have short people and tall people and left-handers and physically challenged. And Kim specializes in special needs and autistic athletes. So, uh, you know, all the way down to the rank beginner. So a whole wide range. Of and I'm probably more proud of the beginners that I've introduced that are now golfers. You know, I'm certainly proud of the championships that, you know, I've been a part of, but probably more proud of just the many, many beginners we've started who now patronize Saquon and are, are having a good time playing golf with their friends and family. Can you talk a little bit about your salesmanship as an instructor? Uh, it's a good question. I try to let the productivity of the teaching and the comfort level and the enjoyment of the lessons be what sells the product. Um, I've never been much of a sales pitch guy. Um, we do want to increase revenue, so we're trying to get a little better at that. Um, our big probably sales points are this facility, Saquon Golf Resort in this valley. It's it's an awesome place with the three golf courses, food and beverage, a hundred room hotel, as I mentioned. Um, but mainly it's, it's providing for our clients an extraordinary experience in, in every way possible that makes them want to come back without having to be talked into coming back. Thank you, Bob. I have a question from uh, Eric Evans here. It seems most beginners expect learning uh, the swing, expect to learn the swing first. What type of feedback do you receive when taking to the course first and having more fun first? The, the, the feedback for me is the person's surprised because the first thing I do is I put them in my cart and tell them we're going on a field trip. 
really? The field trip? Cool. And I take them out to one of the practice holes that we have practice fairways or part three, part three holes on our big courses that are reserved just for golf instruction. And then they're kind of not sure what to think. And then they're pleasantly surprised, almost always. There are times when I misjudge it and I wish, oh gosh, I probably should have started this person hitting little half shots with an eight iron and a bucket of balls off little low tees on the driving range. So there's not an always, always, always. You know, I try to judge it wisely. I think it's an excellent question. Thank you, Eric. Um, probably the other part of the answer is because I'm pretty, I'm pretty comfortable in my skin. Is I don't care if they're not if they're not real jazzed about it because I know it works every single time. So they'll love me in the long run, I guess. Thank you, Bob. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Madsen, uh, that is all the time we have this morning for the Catalyst webinar series. Thank you, Bob, for your uh, for your kind words about the Catalyst, and thank you very much for your time and preparation in presenting uh, to the section. I think uh, uh, an instructor with your with your storied career and and uh, um, very relevant and very practical philosophy and methodology is beneficial for all of us. I um, want to and, and, uh, advise everybody that we will be sending out the Catalyst quiz here shortly along with the YouTube recording address. Um, as usual, please take the quiz and return it to Sharon Kerfman at the section office at skerfman at pgahq.com. A score of 70% or higher will earn one MSR credit for uh, attending today's uh, Catalyst. Um, Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bob.